Welcome to the podcast, Crime Salad, where we talk true crime. I'm your host, Ashley, and with me always is my husband and partner in crime, Ricky. The purpose of this podcast is to honor the victims through ethical storytelling in the hopes of preventing future tragedies. We want our stories to resonate and educate others in hopes that some of these similar cases with identifiable patterns can be prevented. Now, before we jump in, please let us warn you that this is a true crime podcast. The details of this episode may be triggering to some listeners. Listener discretion advised. actually wrote this book with your children. I did. Mm-hmm. And it's only been a year. How did you process and say you th- go from processing death to I need to write a book and help others? You know, I just watched the struggle that my kids were going through. And I actually, you know, I went on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and trying to find something that we could use to cope at nights. Nights are the hardest, it seems like, for everybody when, you know, dealing with anything. But I just wanted some story to read to my kids at night and I just could not find anything. I couldn't find anything that really, you know, suited them or helped them find comfort and peace. And so, you know, I was like, let's just write one. Now, what you just heard was an interview done by Good Things Utah, an ABC News affiliate. The show invited 33-year-old Corey Richens, a recent widow and author. She was welcomed onto the show to promote her first book entitled, Are You With Me? Corey wrote this book to bring comfort to her three young sons while they dealt with the loss of their father just a year earlier. Now, as you can imagine, this would be a very tough situation for any family and extremely hard for three young boys to understand the death of their father. And so the mother took an extra step and wrote a book. In the interview, she explained the frustration about the challenge in finding books for her children to comfort them with the loss of their father. Now, during the interview, Corey also vaguely, and without any emotion, explained the death of her husband, 39-year-old Eric Richens, who was a wealthy commercial masonry contractor. She explained that he may have had a lung issue and alluded to the fact that his death could have been related to long COVID. Surprisingly, something that Eric didn't suffer from. At the time of the interview, the reporters on the show never noticed anything suspicious or out of the ordinary. As we know, everyone grieves differently. It was made very clear that she successfully created comfort to her sons while they navigated their new normal without their father. The book she created showed a father in heaven looking over her boys during all of their important life events, He was there watching them on their first day of school, watching them play sports, watching them during important holidays, and he was even there watching them each night as they slept safely in their beds, knowing that their heaven dad was still with them. They couldn't see him, but they felt his presence in the small things and began looking for signs from their dad in heaven all around them. Knowing that their dad was still a part of their lives brought peace of mind to the fatherless boys. Now, by all accounts, Eric was a wonderful and involved father. He coached his son's various sports teams. He took them four-wheeling, hunting, camping, and hiking. As his family would later say, he lived and breathed for his family. Now, let us tell you a little bit about how Corey and Eric first met. Corey and Eric's fairy tale romance began a decade earlier when Corey was working at a Home Depot as a cashier. And it was Linda King, a fellow employee who was responsible for the faded romance. Linda told KUTV that Eric was her favorite customer who came in frequently due to his masonry business. And she said, quote, you could never forget his laugh. I loved his laugh so much. He always came into my line all the time. Well, Linda began to notice that Eric took a liking to Corey and would often look at her. She encouraged him to go through Corey's line instead of hers and get to know her. And so he took her advice. He began checking out with Corey, making small talk, and eventually the two went on a first date. After their first date, they were constantly together. The two didn't go more than a day without seeing each other. 
Linda King told KUTV that she stayed in touch with Eric and Corey over the years and felt a closeness with the couple who eventually married. She stated, quote, It seemed like they were my children. I was proud of them. That's how I felt about them. I was devastated when Corey told me that Eric died in his sleep from a brain aneurysm. I thought, well, that's what it was. Poor Eric. Now, I know what you're thinking. Did he die from a brain aneurysm or did he die from long COVID? You know the phrase, don't judge a book by its cover? It's a reminder that appearances can be deceiving and we should look beyond the surface to understand the true nature or value of someone. So let's get into Eric's nature and value, then we'll get back to Corey. Corey wrote a beautiful, if unconventional, obituary for her late husband. It began, quote, Eric Eugene Richens made his last extravagant and largely unexpected jester on March 4th, 2022. Signing off on a life, in his own words, lived to the fullest and with few regrets. God certainly perfected the mold when Eric was born to Jean and Linda Richens. Eric's world revolved around his family, his love for hunting, the family cattle ranch, and his insane drive as a successful entrepreneur. Being born into the Richens' legacy shaped Eric's formative years and resulted in a lifetime of hard work, dedication, and fierce loyalty. Being the eldest was a dubious task, but he was up for the challenge and led and loved his sisters fiercely. At an early age, Eric learned the joys of keeping horses and cows around. He spent countless hours helping his dad work the ranch, hauling hay, feeding the animals, and mending fences. He loved his family unconditionally and was a devoted son, brother, and uncle. Eric was a family man who always strove to be the absolute best father and husband. He was an attentive and loving father to his three sons, Carter 9, Ashton 7, and Weston 5, and a devoted husband to the love of his life and wife of nine years, Corey Darden Richens. Eric did absolutely everything in his power to provide his family with every possible opportunity to learn, grow, and have fun. Growing up, Eric was a serious athlete and loved all sports, whether it was watching them or playing them. He was also the coach or assistant coach on all of his boys' teams. He spent countless hours coaching and teaching the boys to play aggressively and give it their all. There was never a dull moment when you were around Eric. He would often show up to a family dinner with no socks or sleeves on his shirt because he rolled the four-wheeler again. Eric loved to have fun and was always the life of the party. He owned almost every motorized toy possible, and because of this, he holds the Richens family record for most rolls and collisions. He also holds the record for the most stitches in one single incident, 200 stitches to his face. Eric was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He served a two-year mission in Mexico City where he learned to speak Spanish fluently. He received a bachelor's degree from the University of Utah in international studies with a minor in Spanish. Together, Eric's mission and his education truly shaped his business acumen. He built a very successful masonry business from the ground up and helped many of his friends do the same. He had a special ability to build close relationships with everyone he worked with, which allowed his business to thrive. Eric loved fully, laughed loudly, and lived life with reckless abandon. He enjoyed great adventures to far-off places. No obstacle was too great for him. No peaks were too high, and the next adventure was always right around the next bend. Words cannot describe the loneliness and loss that is felt in every heart that was lucky enough to know him. We all need to learn from Eric's example and be sure to make time to have fun and do what we love. Thank you, Eric, for being such an inspiration and role model for us all. We know that was long. However, it does a great job of understanding the core of who Eric was as a person, father, brother, son, and husband. He sounds like an amazing person because, by all accounts, he was an amazing person. That wasn't just something nice to say about someone after they died. 
There were countless comments on Eric's obituary telling stories of his generosity, humility, and steadfastness. His death was a profound loss to his family and the community. Now, let's discuss how Eric died. As you may have guessed, it wasn't from long COVID or regular COVID or a brain aneurysm. Corey, who was now a real estate agent and house flipper, was celebrating the purchase of a large 20,000 square foot home, which was partially completed. It was a mansion on a 20 acre compound. We'll discuss the house in the purchase a little later. In celebration of the house purchase, she made her husband a Moscow mule, which is a cocktail made with vodka, ginger beer, and lime juice. Usually it's served in a traditional copper mug. Traditionally, members of the LDS religion generally don't drink alcohol. The Church of Latter-day Saints teaches its members to abstain from consuming alcoholic beverages as part of their religious beliefs and health guidelines. It also advises against the consumption of tobacco, coffee, tea, and illicit drugs. This guidance is followed by the practicing members of the LDS Church who strive to live a healthy and morally upright lifestyle. However, it's important to note that individual adherence to these guidelines may vary, and not all members of the LDS Church strictly adhere to them. Eric was a member in good standing with his church and considered a leader, but he did make the personal decision to drink alcohol occasionally and especially when celebrating. According to Corey, she placed the drink by Eric's bedside and then had to leave to sleep with her son, who was suffering from a night terror. According to Corey, she left her phone plugged in and next to the bed. She was disoriented when she woke up in her son's room around 3 a.m. And because she didn't have her phone with her, she wasn't sure of the exact time when she was headed back to her and Eric's room. It was there that she found Eric unresponsive and cold to the touch. In a panic, she called 911 and begged them to come help her husband. Almost immediately, she moved Eric's body to the floor and began performing CPR on him. It was there on the floor where paramedics found him. Life-saving measures were commenced, but eventually, Eric was pronounced dead at the scene. The paramedics were puzzled because when they began working on Eric, his mouth was filled with blood and a foamy substance. If Corey had been performing CPR, all of that fluid would have expelled itself when she commenced compressions. There were other inconsistencies and odd behaviors too. For instance, she lied about the whereabouts of her phone. It wasn't right next to her bed on the charger. For the next few hours, the phone was turned on, sent messages, and deleted messages, as well as her browser history. This was an odd detail to lie about. The next day after Eric's death, Corey threw a large party celebrating the purchase of a recent flip house. As we already discussed, it was a 20,000 square foot house situated on 20 acres of land. And it came with a separate guest house, which was four bedrooms and 3,300 square feet. The main home came with both an indoor and an outdoor swimming pool, an exercise room, a golf simulator, a multi-purpose indoor volleyball court, a rock climbing wall, two common rooms, two kitchens, and a room with a virtual reality experience. The home came with several covered patios, outdoor living spaces, and an unobstructed view of the mountains. The main home also included eight bedrooms, 12 bathrooms, and the home came with two large dormitory-style rooms for family reunions that could accommodate up to 60 people. The property was also within snowmobile distance to Park City, Utah, which is recognized as a premier destination for skiing and snowboarding, as well as its world-famous ski resorts where the 2002 Winter Olympics were held. It's also well known for the Sundance Film Festival. The purchase price for the house was $3.750 million. By some estimates, it would have taken between $1 to $2 million to properly finish the house with the lavish finishes that would garner top dollar. Corey anticipated selling the property for close to $10 million when she was done with it. Except, Corey wasn't telling the truth. Eric was not on board with purchasing the house, and according to friends, family, and his business partner, 
Eric planned to tell Corey that very night that he wasn't going through with the purchase, and he was also planning to divorce her. Now, according to the charging documents, Corey was presented with a prenuptial agreement from Eric's mom. This was all because of an incident that happened in a past marriage where Eric had to split all of his assets with his ex-wife. She, however, later died in a car accident. Well, to prevent something similar, Eric's mom had a prenuptial agreement prepared and allegedly presented it to Corey on the day of her wedding. In the agreement, they would each keep their sole and separate property, which included the family home, as their own. And Eric had purchased the family home seven months before their wedding from his sister. Also in this agreement, Corey would also give up any rights to Corey's 50% ownership in his masonry business with his best friend and business partner, Cody Wright. The only exception in this prenuptial agreement was in the event of Eric's death. In that event, his partnership interest in his business, as well as all of his personal property, would transfer to his wife. Now, throughout their marriage, Eric suspected that Corey was cheating on him, which was something that she would often deny. Eric's decision to ask his wife for a divorce on the night that he died was a long time coming and was a result of a long list of incidents, including some criminal allegations. In September of 2020, Eric discovered that Corey was able to illegally obtain a home equity line of credit on their family home, which she ran up to $250,000. He also discovered that she had forged documents and withdrawn over $100,000 cash from his bank accounts and had run up his credit cards in excess of $30,000. I'm really curious where all this money went. Corey promised to pay Eric back and begged him not to end their marriage. Eric, who loved his family and loved being a father, agreed. And later, his sister would say, the thought of only seeing his children 50% of the time is why Eric stayed in this marriage with Corey. Now, despite her embezzlement, Eric trusted Corey to pay their taxes. In total, he gave her $134,346 to pay their joint taxes and his separate and corporate taxes. Instead, Corey pocketed all of that money again, crying and begging him not to end their marriage. Once again, she promised to pay him back. Now, it was December of 2020 when Eric began to see the writing on the wall and consulted a divorce attorney. He wanted to know the best way to separate from Corey and protect his assets from her. It was his goal to make sure that his children would be financially cared for in the event of his death. Death had been on his mind quite a bit lately, In fact, a few years earlier when they were both vacationing in Greece, Eric became so violently ill after drinking something given to him by Corey that he began to worry that she's trying to kill him by poisoning him. So in December of 2020, Eric hired both a divorce attorney as well as an estate planning attorney. He created a living trust named the Eric Richens Living Trust. He named his sister as the trustee of the trust and his children as the sole beneficiaries. He also had his business partner as the beneficiary on his $500,000 life insurance policy instead of his wife. Well, a month before Eric was murdered, he discovered that his wife had changed the beneficiary on the corporate life insurance policy from his business partner to herself. She accomplished this by using the pre-saved passwords in his work computer. What she didn't count on was the insurance company sending both Eric and Cody an email confirming the change of the beneficiary to the policy. Eric was able to change it back to Cody, but never informed Corey he knew what she had done. Now, despite all of this evidence against Corey, it almost took a year before she was arrested for Eric's murder. She was finally arrested on May 9th, 2023, and her detention hearing, which was scheduled for May 19th, 2020, was postponed due to the addition of amended charges. These charges give us insight into why there were allegedly past murder attempts on Eric's life. As we know, on May 9th, 2023, she was charged with criminal homicide, aggravated murder, and two counts of possession of a controlled substance with intent to distribute. Now, a month before her arrest, she had the audacity to sue her former sister-in-law, Katie Richens Benson, in her capacity as a trustee of Eric's Living Trust, which he created on November 3rd, 2020, without his wife's knowledge. 
In her civil complaint, she alleged that Eric's creation of the trust was to defraud her and circumvent the terms of their prenuptial agreement. Eric had also placed their family home into his living trust, which he held as his sole and separate property. In her complaint, Corey alleged she and Eric purchased the family home together on November 21st, 2012, while the two were still engaged to be married. However, public records show that Eric had purchased the home from his sister Katie and her husband as his sole and separate property as an unmarried man. Because this purchase took place prior to the marriage, Eric didn't feel it was a community property asset. The prenuptial agreement that Corey signed stated, in part, quote, Except that if husband should die prior to wife while the two are lawfully married, husband's partnership interest in said business and assets shall transfer to the wife. Corey believed that this out-of-context passage meant that Eric had actively tried to defraud her prior to his murder, and she clearly took this as a challenge. For Corey's purposes, she was alleging that she was a silent purchaser. Unfortunately for Corey, silent purchasers aren't a thing, and she has zero evidence proving otherwise. The fact that she signed a prenuptial agreement months later excluding the house means that she was unlikely to prevail in this suit. However, we also know if you kill your husband, you can't profit from their death. The other basis for her lawsuit was the fact that the two commingled their funds, which stated in the prenuptial agreement wouldn't matter until, and again, in the event of Eric's death. At the time of the signing of the prenuptial agreement in 2013, Eric listed his assets as a 50% ownership in C&E stone masonry, a forklift, a skid steer, scaffoldings, saws, two trucks, and a dump trailer. The prenup didn't specifically mention the family home as a separate asset. So it looks like Corey had about $3.6 million in reasons to want her husband dead. But that wasn't her only incentive. According to new documents filed on May 18, 2023, between 2015 and 2017, Corey was able to purchase at least four separate life insurance policies against Eric's life without his knowledge or consent. And of course, she was the beneficiary of all of these policies, which totaled almost $1.947 million. Did she think that all of this would go unnoticed? And the reason why these were never disclosed to Eric's estate planning attorney or his divorce attorney is that Eric didn't know of their existence. As of January of 2022, Corey applied for an additional life insurance policy for another $100,000. That policy was issued on February 4th, 2022, approximately one month before Eric's death. Now, according to the charging documents, a week after obtaining that policy, she drove herself to the Maverick gas station in a town called Draper, located in Utah, on February 11, 2022. And she went there to buy between 15 and 30 light green and blue pills from a friend. This person was a contact in her phone, and in the charging documents, she is identified as CL. And Corey was under the impression she was purchasing fentanyl. As some of you may know, fentanyl has become a public health concern in the United States and Canada because of the way it's manufactured. It's often mixed with other substances such as heroin, cocaine, and other counterfeit prescription pills, often without the knowledge or consent of the user. This mixing can significantly increase the risk of accidental overdose or other adverse effects. And it's more potent than morphine or heroin, and it's highly dangerous when used without proper medical supervision. Even a small amount of illicit street fentanyl can be lethal if taken unknowingly. So now would be a good time to tell you that Eric's real cause of death was, well, you may have guessed it, fentanyl toxicity. He had orally ingested five times the lethal dosage shortly prior to his death. Within weeks of his death, Corey became aware of his true cause of death. She knew it wasn't long COVID or a brain aneurysm, as she wanted people to believe. She told police that as a teenager, Eric was a drug addict who had become addicted to pain pills. She speculated he must have relapsed 20 years later. This is something his family strongly denies. 
CL became a cooperating witness in Eric's murder investigation and told investigators that in order to provide Corey with the pills that she needed, she messaged one of her acquaintances who provided her with the phone number of a drug dealer. On Valentine's Day of all days in 2022, Corey made a sandwich for Eric and put it in his car with a love note. And within minutes of eating the sandwich, Eric became extremely ill, covered in hives, vomited, and he was having trouble breathing. At first, he thought maybe he was having an allergic reaction to something, so he used his son's EpiPen and took Benadryl. This caused him to fall asleep for several hours. The next day, he told his business partner Cody Wright, as well as a sister, that he believed Corey had tried to kill him. Now, why would Corey want to do this? What was her motivation for wanting her husband dead? Well, it's simple. Greed. He was worth more to her dead than alive, and he would solve all their money problems, which were significant. She portrayed herself to be a successful house flipper. However, her liabilities prove otherwise. On March 1, 2022, just three days before Eric's murder, Corey owed $189,000 for her state and federal tax liabilities. That's in addition to the $250,000, $134,000, the $100,000, and the $30,000 that she still owed to Eric for the money that she embezzled from him. And this total amount is almost $514,000 that she owed. And on top of that, she owed almost $2 million to a hard money lender. Hard money lenders are often used in real estate transactions that require quick financing or where traditional lending options may not be readily available. It's thought that Corey needed this money to buy the 20-acre, 20,000-square-foot property. However, she would still need another almost $2 million to complete the construction on that property. And the one person preventing her from completing this purchase and all of her goals was Eric. Now, back to Eric's second murder attempt on Valentine's Day. It clearly didn't do the job as evidenced by the fact that Eric survived. In late February, Corey told her drug dealer that she needed stronger fentanyl. She stated that she needed some of that Michael Jackson stuff. She left a check for $900 for CL inside of a fireplace at one of her flip houses in Midway, Utah. And six days later, Eric Richens died from ingesting a legal dose of street-grade fentanyl. And then the next thing that Corey did is one of the most cold-hearted things that she could do. On March 6, 2022, two days after Eric's death, Corey threw a celebration party. It was at her home to celebrate the closing of the estate property. Tell me that's not messed up. And during this party, Eric's sister showed up, and she discovered that Corey had hired a locksmith to drill into Eric's safe. According to Katie, it contained between $125,000 to $165,000 in cash. That is when Katie informed Corey that the house belonged to Eric's estate, along with all of its contents. She told Corey to wait before opening the safe in her official capacity as Eric's trustee. Corey allegedly flew into a rage, punched Katie in her face, and tried to choke her. And so the police were called. Now, here is where things get interesting. A few days later, on March 9th, 2022, CL was on her way to Draper, Utah, to purchase an additional $1,300 worth of fentanyl. The check was written by Corey, dated March 6, 2022. This was the day that Corey discovered her sister-in-law was the gatekeeper between her and all of Eric's assets, including the family home. It was this purchase that led to the charge of possession with intent to distribute. However, there are some in law enforcement who believe that Corey wasn't done killing. The civil complaint filed by Corey against her sister-in-law is now on hold. Because there are criminal charges pending against Corey, she can't be forced to participate in the discovery process or have her statement taken under oath. Anything Corey might say under oath could be used to incriminate her in her murder trial. All criminal defense have a Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination. Corey's new detention hearing is scheduled for June 12, 2023, so stay tuned. Many people are curious why Eric stayed for so long in this relationship if he suspected that his wife was trying to kill him. 
And the answer is quite simple. It was love. Eric loved his boys and wanted to provide them with a safe and stable home life with two loving parents. By the time Eric was finally ready to leave the marriage, it was too late. Corey had already planned his demise and forever scarred the three boys who lost their father. We will keep you updated on this case as it progresses, and we will likely cover the trial in a future episode. Be sure to subscribe wherever you're listening, drop us a review, and just a quick shout out to our new patrons this week. We have Amber, Amy, Charles, Brooke, Lexi, and Sarah. Thank you all so much for supporting our show. We really appreciate it. We hope that you enjoy the ad-free listens, early access to our episodes, and occasional bonus content. All right. Thank you all so much for listening. We will see you next week.